If you are starting a vertical farm and don't know where to begin or which technology would suit your needs, then reach out to the experts at Cultivated. As indoor farm brokers, they help connect you to the right technology and ensure your project is successful. Best of all, their service is free because they work on behalf of their partners. Visit Cultivated.com to learn more. And that's spelled C-U-L-T-I-V-A-T-D.com or click the link in the show notes. For companies that want to market themselves as in a sustainability focus or alternatively for companies that are hearing from their customers that the customers want to report on carbon from their supply chain. Those are our ideal customers. Those are the people who are coming to us. Either you know, they're wanting to promote themselves or they're under some pressure. Welcome to the Vertical Farming Podcast, weekly conversations with fascinating CEOs, founders, and ad tech visionaries. Join us every week as we dive deep into the world of vertical farming with your host, Harry Duran. Vertical Farming Podcast, Season 8. Welcome back. Welcome back. If you are a regular listener to this show, I appreciate you and your time and for returning and maybe even possibly telling a friend about this show. It's the loyal listeners who get me up every morning to record these interviews, to put together all the materials we need to do to promote these episodes and to get the word out and also do the outreach for new guests to get on the show. So it's an ever working machine that's in progress, always something going on with the show, lining up new sponsors, planning for events as well. And it's really exciting to see everything that's been happening in this space. If you are a new listener to the show, if this is your first episode, thank you so much for coming in. The water's fine, or should I say the form is fine. (laughs) And I want to thank you for taking a chance on us. Hopefully you'll be coming back frequently and telling friends as well about this show. And it's how we grow our audience and it's how we continue to spread the word about all the fantastic things that are happening in this space Excited to bring you some of these fantastic interviews from season eight. In case you missed the kickoff, we had not only Sonia Lowe from Unfold, but also Eric Levesque was on for round three to share his journey. It was an in-depth interview, a bit more personal than Eric's been before. He talked about his experience being a professional gamer, a poker player, and all the twists and turns that led him to the world of vertical farming. Fantastic insights from him as well. He never fails to deliver, so please check that out if you have not already. This week, we're going to talk a little bit about carbon with Daphne Prius, the founder and CEO of Carbon Book. Daphne shares some tips on how you can help manage the carbon footprint of your farm. And our conversation talks a bit about how to make vertical farming more environmentally friendly as well. She has an inspiring story, and I know you'll get a lot of tips if this is a topic that's of interest for you. This is one of my favorite parts of this show. I get to actually read a review that's come in and it's written by Wit A. He specifically mentions episode 64 with Ali Daniali, who is a fan of the show, who is a friend of the show as well. Wit writes, while I enjoy this entire podcast, this particular episode stands out as my favorite so far. The conversation was not only engaging and interesting, but I learned many new things and I imagine the content will be very actionable for many people. I especially resonate with the focus on small farming as it is usually topics surrounding large venture funded farms that capture most of the content I see and hear. Well done, Harry and Ali. Thank you so much, Wit, for writing that thoughtful review. I really appreciate it. If you want to be like Wit, then you too can leave a rating and review. Just All you have to do is go to ratethispodcast.com forward slash VFP. As you just heard, I would be more than happy to read yours out on a future episode. I've spoken to a couple of people about writing a review, and you know who you are if you're listening to this. So please do that. I would love to read yours out next. Just a reminder that we've created a new community on LinkedIn called, you guessed it, Vertical Farming Community. I'll have the link in the show notes, but if you search specifically for that group in LinkedIn, we've got some new folks that have just joined us and we're just building a friendly space for folks to talk about vertical farming, whether you're new or just entering the space. Also, don't forget to check out our newest entry into the resources space. It's cea.events. We're just starting to get that populated and our goal is to list any event upcoming in the controlled environment agriculture space. So it's not only vertical farming, but we'll be listing events around greenhouses, anything related to ag tech as well. We want to be an all-encompassing umbrella for all events CEA related. CEA.events. 
Okay, before we jump into this uninterrupted conversation with Daphne, here are a few words from the folks that support this show. This year, Vertiform takes place from September 26th through September 28th at the Exhibition Center in Dortmund, Germany. For those new to Vertiform, it's the most significant trade fair for next-level farming and new food systems. Their international platform is set to showcase the latest developments in innovative controlled production systems for vegetables, salad crops, herbs, and microgreens, as well as sustainable fish, insect breeding, fruit cultivation, and medicinal plants. Vertifarm is shaping the future of vertical farming and new food systems. Reserve your ticket and learn more at vertifarm.de. That's V-E-R-T-I-F-A-R-M dot D-E. This year, Indoor Ag Tech is coming to New York City's Times Square, and it's bringing together the world's leading growers, retailers, tech providers, seed companies, and investors. Join us from June 29th to June 30th to meet, expand networks, and produce fruitful partnerships. The team has been gracious enough to provide listeners of this show with an additional 10% off of the registration. Simply use promo code VFP when you register and lock that in. And by the way, if you're on the fence, remember that early bird discount ends on May 11th. After a pivotal year for CEA, the summit will explore what's needed to ensure the industry can continue innovating and growing into a crucial part of the global agri-food supply chain. So Daphne Proust, CEO of Carbon Book, thank you so much for joining me on the Vertical Farming Podcast. Thank you for the invitation. We were chatting a bit, as as most folks do here in the Midwest, about the weather <laughs> <laughs> prior to getting started. So for the benefit of the listener, where's home for you right now? For me, it's in Maine, along the coast of Maine. Yeah. Were you born and raised there? No, no. I came from Colorado originally oh. in a farming community. What's been the, the biggest difference for you going from Colorado to Maine or is there anything you miss? <laughs> the climate is so different, you know. Yeah. The part of Colorado I grew up in was uh, quite dry. And here we've got enough water, you know, for growing trees and forests and things. It did teach me at a very early age the importance of water for agriculture and the huge mm. limitations we're if we don't manage fresh water appropriately. Yeah, makes sense. What city in Maine? Uh, no city. I, I live in a okay. town of 100 people. <laughs> so uh. <laughs> the opposite. And just before this, we were living in Chicago for about 25 years. So the contrast could not be bigger. What would you say you love most about where you are now then? The outdoors, the wildlife. You know, yeah. It's, it's a, a, a great place for thinking, for you know, planning and writing and it's been really refreshing to get out of the the chaos for a while yeah you mentioned thinking and, and writing which is something i think about when uh for the benefit of listener i'm up north in northern minnesota and at a cabin which on camera probably looks like i'm in in a sauna right now but <laughs> there's lots of wood paneling all around and i always think about being in quiet places to do some writing is that something you you, you try to to find time for when, when you can i do yeah it's a nice change of pace. Yeah. And so I'm doing a, a bit of homework on, on your background and, and looking at your history as, you know, after you finished your university studies. And it, it seems like the world of uh, agriculture and where you ended up at Carbon Book is, would, probably wouldn't be a surprise to anyone who's been following your journey <laughs> for all these years. But right. can you talk a little bit about, you know, we'll make our way to current time. But I'm just, I'm, I always like hearing a little bit about origin stories and you know, how you got your start in this field? Well, as I said, I grew up in an agricultural community, so agriculture was always very close to, you know, to my background, my early experiences. When I was time for college, I focused on science and uh, became yeah. a geneticist. For a while, I was pursuing that in, in an academic space, so I went to uh, graduate school at MIT and then Stanford and then... Um, took a faculty role at the University of Chicago. And while I was there, I was focused on plants and pollination and understanding the mechanisms of life. But after a while, I was frustrated that I wasn't having an impact on people's lives beyond teaching and training students. And so yeah. I spun out a company while I was in the university, and that became focused on an outdoor crop sorghum, which uh, we, we developed, we innovated in that crop, and then we grew a seed distribution business out of that and sold product around the world. So we got to know the, the situation the farmers were 
their challenges with um, producing crops, with climate change, and all of the uh, issues going on in global agriculture. After that business sold, uh, I focused in on carbon growth, and uh, we've been looking at indoor agriculture. So that's been uh, an interesting transition. I also noticed you had some, uh, you were doing some work with the New West Genetics as well. And then you also had some some experience with, uh, early experience with uh, AI and then looking at some of the, the remote sensing stuff as well, which I thought was interesting. Absolutely. Well, I've, um, you know, since, since the journey of founding my own business and I've also found it really interesting and, and exciting to help other entrepreneurs who are going through that same process. So I'm on the board of directors at New West Genetics, as well as a couple other boards of companies focused in agriculture. And uh, I often say it's really rewarding to help new founders avoid the mistakes I made over the years. You know, the first time you do something, it's always a learning experience. And so, you know, it's really exciting to see all the business ideas that are coming out lately in agriculture. It's a period of tremendous growth. I think there's a lot of amazing innovation and the kind of innovations that used to happen only in large companies are not possible because costs have come down and technology has made everything easier. With regard to AI and software, I also was a partner in a company that made a software for biologists. We sold that company, so that was a SaaS business. Ended up with 600,000 users worldwide, so we grew that from start to sale. And so that experience, along with the work in agriculture, came together at at Carbon Growth. We had some technology for thinking about how crops grow and using AI for that. Pulled all of that together into our current product. It sounds from just uh, your background that there's definitely an entrepreneurial streak in you. And, oh, yeah. and I'm wondering how far back <laughs> that goes and if that's something that's uh, you've always had this passion for starting companies. Uh, yeah, absolutely. My parents were entrepreneurs. And so okay. that definitely was a, a big impact. I, I used to say that summer vacation and after school program was was their business and that's really the way they they handled it with us we we learned everything from a very early age growing up in that family and uh yeah then i always was encouraged to do business activities even as a as a youngster you know so you sell greeting cards or whatever it was you know to earn a little bit of extra money and understand how business worked and my parents were very good at training me and you know just go get a bank account balance your checkbook every <laughs> month you know even yeah. as like a preteen even so uh, it, was, yeah. it was very early being exposed to that way of thinking and uh, and so I'd say unlike a lot of academics or scientists I had the basics of you know how a, a basic business operates and, and that really did help me as I thought about bringing, you know, business science into the business world. Yeah, that experience is extremely helpful being an entrepreneur myself. And I, and I think if you don't have that experience, you'll learn the lessons, but you'll learn them the hard way. Yeah, <laughs> and you'll learn absolutely. about them because you'll make the mistakes, you'll fall on your face, and then you'll figure out, don't do it that way instead. And right. it's, it's, um, it's nice to know that you had the support of your parents to help you with probably some of the mistakes they made in the past to make sure that those were repeated (laughs) with your business ventures. Right. Well, and and so much of it is knowing what you don't know, right? And then knowing how to find the right expertise in someone else and being able to tell the difference between someone who really knows their stuff and someone who doesn't. So, it's yes, it's very hard to absorb all of that. So I know uh, each... When you think about uh, which one of your ventures is the most memorable from an inception starting point, a lot of times it's like asking a parent you know, about who's their favorite child. <laughs> and obviously, uh, a lot of the focus is on Carbon Book. But you know, when you think about how you go about starting a company and what you experienced before, can you put us in that mindset of where you were in 2019 when the idea started to, to, to you know, flower for, for Carbon Book and what your thought process was at that time? Well, 
you know, as I said, I've spent most of my years in agriculture. And what was really starting to become very clear in 2019 was that um, climate change was here. You know, we had been hearing about it for a long time, but we were really starting to see real impacts. Also, that water is one of the key limitations to agriculture. I mentioned that earlier, but you could really see that playing out worldwide with droughts and, and global issues. So I was excited about the idea of indoor farming as a way of really managing in places that were water limiting. And I, I think mm-hmm. it is one of the ways that we can have a, a very important solution to that problem. You know, if you think about yeah. does the Middle East grow the crops it needs to feed itself, it you know, something with indoor farming could really be a, an important answer. So those things were playing out in my mind, but also then thinking about how do you build an economy that gears everyone toward doing better with in terms of carbon emissions and how do you empower and enable all of these businesses to do that and you know having worked with a lot of farmers and also getting to know indoor farmers you appreciate that their days are very full and they're very packed with simply trying to get the job done you know get crop grown to get the right yield to get the right pricing to keep the business running And so I could see that that industry and that group of people would be asked to report on their carbon emissions, and they don't necessarily have the expertise in-house to do that. It's a big pain in the neck to do that rigorously. You've got to do it in a science-based way. And it's very important for the consumers of that kind of information that there are uniform standards, that things are reported accurately. So... It felt to me like we needed to help people, to empower people, to be able to get the information they needed, to be able to relay that to stakeholders. And so just coming off the heels of having built and sold a software business, yeah. you know, it seemed to me that a simple tool that has a great user interface and is easy for people to use, doesn't take a lot of their time. Could uh, you know? Could help them do what they needed to do, but also move the industry toward a more beneficial direction and, and use less carbon. Because I, I really think the industry has potential for a huge impact on agriculture. You know, as I said, water is an issue, but also reducing fertilizer use, reducing pesticide use, all of those great things about it. But one of the you know unpleasant parts that we don't all talk about is if you look at the industry as a whole. It consumes a lot of power, which means it has a really big carbon footprint. And, you know, and other aspects of it also are are feeding into carbon emissions. So I'd like to see the industry really thrive and succeed. Compared to outdoor farming, it's not as good on carbon, and we need to help it get better. So I know that's a long, complicated answer, but it was kind of the synthesis of climate change, carbon intensity, empowering people to do something in a very easy way and hopefully make the industry thrive. Can you talk a little bit about how you've seen the indoor farming, the the sector mature over the years? I, I imagine when you started in 2019, I don't know how much of the business was focused on indoor farming, what percentage of that, and how that shifted based on what, how you've seen it, uh, the maturity happen over, over these past few years. Well, yeah, we've always been focused only on indoor farming. So... I would say that early on, there was huge exuberance for indoor farming, vertical farming, especially lots of money being thrown at it. I think as it's matured now, we've seen some of those businesses operate successfully and some of them really struggle. So today, reality is hitting people in the face, I think. Yeah. It's also true that consumers love the products. You know, that's that's been borne out. You know, there's no doubt that people will really, you know, buy this kind of produce. It's it's better tasting. It's fresher. It looks great. No problem with sales. But doing it in an economically successful way has been challenging for some groups. And uh, there was a lot of exuberance. I, I think, you know, that's been the case a lot of times. For the 
greenhouse, the broader greenhouse space, they've gone through consolidation. There are some operators who have done extremely well. I think the bigger conglomerates do better. There's a lot of thinking about logistics, where to locate, all of those things yeah. going into it. But uh, yeah, I think it's an industry that's here to stay and it's it's got a good growth rate. I also have seen the input providers really mature over this time. So great innovation in lighting, in fertilizer, mm -hmm. substrates are growing, seeds, seed yeah. breeding, all of those things are really making a healthy ecosystem, you know, for the informers. For the benefit of folks who are not familiar with Carbon Book, can you talk a little bit about the offering? Who is an ideal client? And then what's their experience? You know, maybe a little bit about, you know, for like who this is a good fit for, what that onboarding looks like, and if there's a, a process for getting them online, just so people have, have an idea of the scope of work that you provide. I would say that for companies that want to market themselves as in a sustainability focus, or alternatively for companies that are hearing from their customers that the customers want to report on carbon from their supply chain. Those are our ideal customers. Those are the people who are coming to us. Either you know, they're wanting to promote themselves or they're under some pressure. And we also have customers in Europe where the pressure is coming from regulatory. But here in the U.S., it's mostly a you know, customer-driven large retailer wants to have some numbers and how do I provide that? The tool takes about 30 minutes a month to enter the data. And in fact, much of the data can be entered by the account. So a grower doesn't have to think of this as a big draw on the time. We've used yeah. uh, principles. There, there's a, a very deep discipline called human computer interaction, HCI. Okay. And we've used those principles to make the software very intuitive. So most people can sit down in front of it and on the first try, they know exactly what to do. There's yeah. very simple drop-down menus. You just, once you set up, then month to month, it's very to keep going. You can use the information from the prior month and just tweak what changes. And it covers all of the inputs of your facility. So not just power use, but uh, water use, fertilizer, substrate, materials, mm. Covers transportation. Okay. So, you know, did you drive to the store? Did you ship the product to yeah. the warehouse? All those aspects. And then while you're doing that, it shows a report with bar graphs. Where is your biggest carbon emission coming from? And you can see how that's um, the different aspects of the business are contributing to that. It also accounts for beneficial things you do, like maybe you recycle, you compost your biomass waste. You use a renewable source of power. You've negotiated with a power company for a power purchase agreement. All of those things are okay. positives are in there as well. And at the end of it, there's a score for how much carbon per um, pound or ton or kilogram of produce. And so you can see how you're doing. And then it also allows benchmarking. So you can see how you compare to other indoor farms. Are you in the bottom okay. quartile? Are you in the top 10%? And yeah. that gives you a sense of, you know, what you might need to do to do better. And I imagine it's similar sized farms when you're doing that comparison? Not yet. Not today. We're building the database. Okay. And I think as we get more and more people on board, it will make sense to parse it in different ways. But yeah, it's, we basically look at carbon per kilogram of produce because... Okay. Retail, and this is already happening, retail is starting to label products on the shelf with how mm, much carbon yeah. is embedded in making that product. So when the consumer yeah. looks at one tomato versus another tomato, they're just going to see a number, how much carbon. And it's not really going to matter to them if it came from a small facility or a big facility or an out and farm. It's just literally yeah. how much carbon. And so that's where we're working. Are you seeing any movement uh, when you think when you mention that the thing that comes to mind is how people see labels like uh, natural and organic 
and how that's influencing their buying decisions. And I'm wondering if we're moving towards, you know, the carbon footprint label or some sexier <laughs> identification yeah. and how, from a marketing perspective, the challenge is to let the consumer know that that's something that they should be looking out for as well. Yeah. Well, that, that's already in stores. So I'd encourage you as you buy things, you'll see some leading companies starting to report on this. And, you know, we saw recently, you know, several others jumping on board. So PepsiCo, Nestle. Unilever. Mm. Unilever says 75,000 yeah. products will be labeled soon. And so oh. whether the industry wants to or not, there will be labels. And also, I think people might be aware, but just to mention that for the large publicly traded companies now, the SEC is going to have, starting in 2024, a requirement that you report on carbon. And it's going yeah. to be an, an accounting standard. It needs to be based in substance. So it can't be greenwashing yeah. or just, um, you know, happy talk. It has to be really solid. And yeah. so this is coming. I think this is going to, you know, surprise a lot of people when you know, 2024 is not very far away. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you're going to have to report your score, good or bad. Yeah. And you know, your customer will need to have that if they're a public company. You mentioned the likes of uh, Unilever, and I'm wondering how you see those partnerships with your, your large input providers. Can you talk a little bit about that relationship? Yeah, well, we see ourselves as helping those big companies that have to do reporting, whether it's to regulators or, yeah. you know, financial markets or other things. And many of them, as you probably know, have set very aggressive carbon reduction goals for themselves. So we see ourselves as helping them uh, collect the data and they want to help their suppliers do better. So it isn't just yeah. about policing or, or collecting information. They'd like to be able to say to a group of suppliers, hey, this is a situation where maybe there's room for improvement or maybe incentivize them to improve. Like, if you can get your carbon footprint down by 5%, we'd be happy to pay you a premium. You know, and mm. I think that a lot of the largest companies are really motivated to do that. They, yeah. you know, as I said, they set aggressive goals and they've spent the last few years trying to get their internal operations to be better. They've kind of exhausted what they can do there. They've worked very much with the power grid to do the best they can there. And now the only yeah. place to go is to look at their supplier network. And in many cases, you know, of the goals they set, only about 20% can be met with what they've already done. So the rest of it, the 80% that's left, has to come from the suppliers. And so they are looking top mm -hmm. to bottom at every single supplier and helping, you know, often smaller companies do better. I couldn't help but think as people were going through this process and entering all their inputs in, into the system. There may be some cases where they're they're surprised at the output that comes out of there. And, and I'm wondering if, you know, from some of the, the, the clients that you've worked with, you know, as they start to, to put in all the different factors that might affect their carbon footprint, are there some things that are really surprising to them where they're, you know, they, they didn't realize what that impact was? I suppose energy often is one of those that people really, you know, they know that this is a big expense for the business. They know they're using a lot of power, but when they see it laid out there as big of a contributor it is. And so the good side of that is just a little improvement in energy use, energy use efficiency. Maybe it's about changing lighting from incandescence to LEDs, you know, ways, you know, combined heat and power generation, various things that they can do. They can have a yeah. huge, huge lasting change on their carbon emissions, which, by the way, also in many places qualifies them to collect carbon credits. So they get paid back for that. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is a situation where there's a lot of incentives for people to get that. I've noticed uh, you talked a little bit about the on the site about the collaboration you have with U.S. National Renewable Energy Lab and the Danforth Center. And I'm wondering how those relationships came about and how that's helped the work that you're doing at Carbon Book? Well, we won a com competition. It was a grant competition sponsored by Wells Fargo and the Danforth Center and NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab. 
the competition was focused on indoor farming and innovation in that area. We were the only one that was doing what we're doing on, on carbon footprint. We worked with the Danforth Center, which has a lot of research greenhouses to help develop our tool. And we went from concept to launch product during during the time of the grant. So we, we progressed really fast through their program. The NREL collaboration is also really interesting. This is one of the DOE Department of Agriculture in Golden, Colorado. And they've really specialized in building materials and construction. And so what we're doing with them is thinking about how the choice of materials for greenhouses, for indoor farms, can have more or less embedded carbon in that. And then Mm. in addition, how changing ways of operating can affect carbon footprint. So, for example, if in a greenhouse, do you use shading to alter lighting? And things like that can have a big impact. So it begs the question as to how early in the process can a flow like this help a new farm? Because if you're talking about building materials, you know, a lot of times they may not give those the proper consideration to your point that they should be. That's right. So there's two kinds of considerations when you're standing up a new facility. First, the embedded carbon in the materials you use, and that will be calculated you know, over the lifetime of those materials. So it's sort of amortized, if you will, over time. But then the choices you make will affect your day-to-day carbon footprint. And there are choices you can make that will minimize it and choices you make that will, uh, you know, maximize it. And so probably very good to do some scenario building before you really, you know, make those selections. I noticed also that you were selected as one of the top five agritech startups in Canada and, and also yeah. most innovative Canada-based agtech companies. And I'm wondering how, the, how that process uh, came about. Yeah, well, the, the original founders of the company started in Quebec. They were a team okay. of AI folks. And then I joined yeah. shortly yeah. after that to build out the carbon footprint part. But uh, they were based in Montreal. And so we've kept yeah. the company there. Although I'm based in the U.S., you know, and I think it's a, it's been beneficial to us to have a working footprint in both countries. It gives us a more international feel. And yeah. we have had incoming customers and clients from all around the world. And as you probably are aware, when it comes to climate and carbon, there are many countries who are actually out in front of the U.S. in terms of adoption of policies and standards and regulations. So we've always taken a a global view to this problem. We were chatting uh, uh, prior to recording about uh, how you were at the companies at Indoor Icon last year and uh, both be there again this year. How many years have you been going to these conferences? And I'm wondering if you've seen the dynamic of the companies that attend or the experiences and the conversations you're having at these conferences, how they're evolving over the years. Well, not a lot of years, really, because we were getting started on this in 2019. And then within months of getting started, the pandemic happened. And we were all under a travel freeze, if you recall. And particularly a Canadian-based company, we could not cross the border and attend events in the U.S. So that was okay, though, because... For a couple of years, we just hunkered down and did software coding, and we needed to do that. And so last year, 2022, was actually our first rollout at, at the Indoor Icon. Great event, great reception. We had a booth. Yeah. We had a lot of people that came. And there, a lot of folks were saying, hmm, haven't thought much about this yet. Haven't thought <laughs> a lot about, you know, measured my carbon footprint. So that's conversations evolved now. And, uh, you know, I'd say that, People are kind of in two camps. There are those who are embracing, you know, the new world of reporting on carbon, which is is absolutely happening. And then there are those who are really hoping it doesn't happen. (laughs) So they're trying to, you know, avoid it. But I really don't think it can be avoided. Yeah, it feels like burying your head in the sand moments if you're not confronting the realities of of where we're headed uh, from the climate change perspective. Do you look at the, the broader picture a lot in terms of climate change? I'm assuming that's something you follow fairly closely. And, and I'm wondering if you have some thoughts about, you know, where we're headed 
even outside of the indoor ag tech world and, and, you know, anything that we can, I know that Carbon Book is doing your part to help people realize the, the scope of the problem, but I'm wondering yeah. if there's anything in that field that is on your mind lately. Well, agriculture broadly is a huge, huge contributor to carbon emissions, yeah. but it also can be a very important solution. And I've been really interested and excited to see the advances in research over recent years. People understanding how soil health can really affect carbon capture. Rethinking fertilizer use because fertilizer is one of those things that contributes to, you know, nitrogen emissions and those are equivalent to greenhouse gas effects. So, you know, that industry is going through a huge change as it reevaluates its carbon. And a lot of that Pressure again is coming from the largest consumer companies, like you know, those who manufacture foods we eat day to day. They are now asking farmers to think very hard about their use of fuel, their use of fertilizer, their the crops they grow, how they cultivate their land. And there's also I find this to be a really interesting and promising arena. If you think about 10,000 years of human history and breeding crops, we've been mostly looking at the parts we see, the parts above ground. But people are realizing yeah. that there's huge diversity in the root system and that the depth and, and branching of roots can affect how much carbon goes to the soil. So there's now a, yeah. a huge generation, new generation of breeders that are looking for roots and root structure. And I think we could really reshape our core crops to capture more carbon, which is really exciting. So, you know, I know that's not answering about the whole world of carbon, but I tend to focus yeah. on the agriculture side, which is, which is probably about 20% of our carbon and climate change issues. I'm assuming there's a, always a lot on your mind and, and there's always new challenges when you get out of bed in the morning and, and things that you that need to get done. But I'm just curious if there's a, a tough question you've had to ask yourself recently. Oh, <laughs> well, I, I'd say like any startup CEO, it's, you know, the the financial climate has been a little bit challenging in the last year for companies that are raising yeah. capital. We're doing yeah. okay, but, you know, that's something... Cash should be on the mind of every startup CEO, honestly, and yeah. how you build yeah. your business and get it to where it needs to be. So that's one that's kind of there daily and uh, finding investors that really can believe in the vision you have, even before you're a large company and profitable. You know, that's always a challenge for small companies. Yeah. I'm curious, given the experience you've had in your entrepreneurial journey and the companies you started and, and led previously, how have you grown and matured as a leader uh, throughout the years? Oh, that's that's a great question. I can say, you know, looking back at myself 15 years ago, it's a little bit humbling and humiliating sometimes of thinking of all the things you didn't know. I think one, which may be surprising, stress level is down. There were a lot of things when you don't know what you're doing or you're doing it for the first time, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of tension. It's so much easier if you've seen it before, you know, so yeah. that's been very helpful. I would say just ability to present, communicate, you know, talk about ideas and, and an ability to, you know, kind of pace the information flow. That's really improved. Yeah. It's hard for founders and innovators to convey their vision to people who've never heard it before. So that is always something that's a challenge, but I think I've gotten a bit better at that. Working with people, trying to hire the right people for the problem, I, I think that's that's been, you know, good experiences there, good learnings, and keeping a team motivated. And probably mm -hmm. that, you know, a lot of times we think, the most important thing in these businesses is the technology, but it's actually the people that are making the technology. Yeah. So you really have to focus on that. Has there been uh, some experiences you've had with mentors previously that have been memorable and, and instrumental in your growth? I've been very lucky to have amazing mentors over the years. And, you know, those experiences, those relationships are just so valuable. 
you know, I kind of go back to the the people who I worked with that were in science and rigor and, you know, how, yeah. how important it is to have the credibility. They were amazing. And then on the business side, finding people that were willing to teach me what I didn't know and patient, you know, to help me do that. Yeah. As I said, I was a scientist first and then a business person and learning to communicate to those two audiences takes some effort. So had some wonderful mentors that helped with that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to have the mix of both of those experiences because they're two completely different worlds. And I think yes. it's been, I'm sure, invaluable for you to be able to, to bring those two together. And sometimes they speak completely different languages, I'm sure, at times as well. Yeah, I would say... The language is different, but in a lot of ways, the objectives are similar. You're trying to do something that is a new breakthrough when it's when it's in science. Yeah. And similarly in business, yeah. you're trying to have a new, especially entrepreneurial companies, you're trying to have something that is a breakthrough that's going to disrupt the current markets. It's going to yeah. you know, be something that people are drawn to. So those objectives are similar. You fund them in different ways in the Scientific world, it's often nonprofit that funds government grants, things like that. But you still are yeah. pitching all the time, just like you yeah. do with companies. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit of framing, a little bit of uh, focusing on the ultimate currency. Instead of building publications, you're adding dollars to the company's yeah. account. But otherwise, I think there are a lot of parallels. And I would say... You know, I see a lot of scientists be intimidated by the business world. I don't think they should be. I think they just need to talk to someone who's been there and done it, and they have all the skill set they need to to function very well. It's just a matter of learning the language. This might be a good episode to send any scientists in the future who are considering an entrepreneurial (laughs) journey (laughs) to get a taste of what your experience has been like. We need more of them, for sure. Yeah. So Daphne, I'd like to leave some time at the end of these episodes. I've been doing this lately and have you give you some space for any messages you have for folks within the vertical farming community, because as you know, there's a lot of your peers and colleagues that listen to this podcast and folks that are in this space. But I've been just leaving some time for you if you have a message or any anything you feel like you want to say to this community. Oh, wow. Well, thanks for that opportunity. That's uh, great. <laughs> So I've touched on a little bit of this, but just kind of reiterate. One, the world we live in, the economy we live in, the the business situation is going to require carbon reporting. It absolutely is. And if we pretend it's not going to happen, we're going to be left. So that's the first thing. The second is there's room for improvement. The industry does have whole, on average, a pretty healthy carbon footprint, you know, I should say pretty large carbon footprint, but some operations are running in a way that is reducing carbon footprint. So it's definitely a problem for the industry as a whole, but it's solvable. So we're at a moment in time here where the vertical farming industry could really take a leadership role as a group and say, hey, we're committed to having a healthy environment, not just sustainability in terms of water use or pesticide use or fertilizer use, but also carbon emissions. And we want to be the leaders in that. I think if they remain silent or not you know, stepping up, then it's it could be that they get steamrolled by others carrying a message that's negative and not what they'd like to have. Now, we recently saw a coalition of several vertical farms coming out to talk about, you know, strong sustainability. And I think that's just wonderful progress. That sends a great message. But that kind of leadership is needed. And, you know, a lot of times when you're within an industry, you're thinking about your competition is the other vertical farm next door and how you want to position is better than them. That's not what's needed here in this carbon. Because I think what will happen more likely is that consumers will compare vertical farming to historic outdoor in terms of carbon. And when they see that tomato on the grocery shelf, it's going to be which one looks nicer, which one tastes better, but has a different carbon score and how much does it cost. 
And the consumer is going to integrate all those factors and figure out what they want to buy. And unfortunately, I think if the tomato is 10 times more carbon as it was grown in a vertical, there are a bunch of consumers who will say, I'm not buying that. Or if it tastes better, I don't care if it looks better. I'm just not doing it. And we're seeing that born out in cases where particularly younger consumers, even if it causes some margin. So I think that the industry needs to think of itself as an industry and because I think that's how the consumers will look at it. And leaders need to step up and be having very positive messages and teaching others how to reduce carbon, not keep it all yeah. secretive, you know. Yeah. So that, that would be my hope for it. It sounds like you'll be having many more of those conversations in a couple of days <laughs> at, at, at Indoor EdCon. So uh, yes, I want to thank you yes. for taking the time to, to come on and share your inspiring story, especially you don't see a lot of folks coming from the, the science background and with as much entrepreneurial and business experience as, as you have. And I think uh, a lot of that has been borne out in what you've been able to do at, at Carbon Book. So I appreciate you, you sharing your, a bit of your background as well and sharing your story. Yeah, Arian, thank you for all you're doing for the vertical and these, these podcasts are a great service to the whole community. So thank you. I appreciate that. So folks to learn more at carbonbookinc.com. Anywhere else you want to send folks to connect with you or learn more about Carbon Book? For, for those who will be at the Indoor Ag Con, my colleague Eugene Losa will be there and uh, he's going to be in a panel. So we'll be posting on our social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera, that you can find. So we'll meet many of you there at the conference. Yeah, and we'll make sure we have all those links available in the show notes as well. So thanks again for your time, Daphne. I appreciate it. Great. Well, thank you. Have a good day. Thanks again to Daphne for coming on the show and sharing her expertise. As always, full show notes are available at verticalfarmingpodcast.com. We go to great lengths to write you summaries, key takeaways, quotes mentioned from the episode as well. So please check that out, verticalfarmingpodcast.com. New news every week at verticalfarmingweekly.com. We're revamping our verticalfarmingjobs.com space and our newest entry into services for this community is cea.events. So please check that out if you haven't done so already. Special thanks to our season eight title sponsor, Cultivated. If you are looking into a vertical farm and don't know where to start or which technology would suit your needs, reach out to them today. Best of all, their service is free because they work on behalf of their partners. Learn more at cultivated.com and that's spelled C-U-L-T-I-V-A-T-D.com. Just leave out that last E. Podcast production and marketing provided by Fullcast. If you're interested in starting a podcast for your business or brand, you can learn more at fullcast.co. And as a reminder, you heard at the top of this show, if you're enjoying past episodes, please leave us a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash VFP. Nothing would make me happier than read those out on a future episode. Tune in next episode for my conversation with another fascinating leader from the world of vertical farming. This time it's Marcos Enriquez from Easy Farmer. Until we meet again, here's to your health. Thanks for listening. To read the full show notes for this episode, which includes any links mentioned in the episode, as well as a full show transcription, visit verticalfarmingpodcast.com. There, you can sign up for our email list to be notified when new episodes are published.